Hi all. Today we're going to have a lecture by video on uh, Sufism, our introduction to Sufism, as part of the fourth module in our History of Happiness course. Uh, Sufism is a form of Muslim mysticism, and what do I mean by mysticism? Uh, it's an interior spiritual experience, although it has also historically a social dimension. Um, Michel de Certeau, a great French scholar, uh, defined mysticism as the quest to discern in our earthly fallen language the now audible word of God. And although Muslims wouldn't agree that human beings are fallen, uh, they would agree or at least the Sufis would agree, uh, that God is unknowable and ultimate truth is something that cannot be expressed in ordinary human language. Um, so mysticism uh, in De Certeau's uh, understanding points to what is not known, cannot be said, because mystical language engages with the absolute. The absolute is beyond human ken. Uh, so mystical language can only say uh, what is absolute or unbounded by erasing itself. It is the language of unsaying. Uh, and this kind of paradoxical language, this kind of concentration on what is beyond everyday ordinary uh, consciousness, uh, is intended to include all of creation. It's, it's an expansion of the self. And in fact, Sufis talked about um, uh, the human being as uh, a small universe, uh, that all of the universe is in, uh, embedded in a human being. Uh, so I mentioned that there's a social dimension to all of this. And um, uh, it has many elements. Uh, there's a, a Sufi master relationship. Uh, we heard last week um, that uh, there's such a thing as modern Buddhism, which is very different from the ancient form uh, and much more uh, sort of oriented towards uh, large groups of people. Uh, whereas originally Buddhism was perhaps uh, something for a spiritual elite or for an elite among the monks. And the like, in the same way, there's, there's modern Sufism. And modern Sufism uh, is much more individualistic uh, and uh, less uh, oriented towards the Sufi master uh, relationship that's an innovation because in medieval times, uh, a Sufi adept, someone who had adopted the Sufi way, was absolutely bound to obey uh, the, the master, uh, called in Persian a peer, in Arabic a sheikh. Uh, Sufis gather for recitation uh, of texts of the Quran, of holy texts of various sorts. Uh, or of phrases from the Qur'an, uh, which is called dhikr, or recitation. Uh, they have places of pilgrimage that they go to, uh, tombs of the great saints, which are considered to be sites of blessing. Uh, there are Sufi orders. Sufi orders developed later in Sufi history. The first, uh, first forms of Sufism were a kind of um, asceticism, um, sometimes involving seclusion of the individual, uh, much more monk-like, although uh, Islam does not have monasteries or monks and the population is ever married. So a lot of Sufis have wives and, and children or spouses and children. Uh, and um, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, Later on, uh, there, there developed Sufi orders, which could be compared to Catholic lay orders, I suppose. Uh, 
and then there are Sufi centers uh, in the east. These are called Khanaka. In, uh, in the West, uh, they, in, in North Africa, for instance, they're called Zawiya. Uh, they sometimes doubled as uh, as mental asylums. Uh, they were places where, and, and, uh, and as hostels, uh, Sufis were often uh, traveling and uh, would, would stay at the Sufi center when they arrived in a town. Uh, and uh, then there's music and dance, uh, which is social. Uh, uh, often at a, a mansion of a, a wealthy Sufi or uh, in the uh, Sufi center, uh, the uh, Mevlevi order uh, or Maulavi order uh, centered on the great uh, spiritual teacher uh, Jalaluddin Rumi of the 13th century uh, specialized in, um, in dance uh, and, and whirling and so became famously known as uh, as the whirling dervishes. So all of these are, are um, social dimensions of Sufism. Sufism developed out of Islam, and uh, uh, which, which began in uh, the early seventh century. Prophet Muhammad was, was, is traditionally said to have been born around 570. Uh, from the clan of Abu Hashim in in Mecca in Western Arabia. Uh, Mecca was the site of a major shrine to God uh, and uh, a sanctuary for nonviolent uh, trade and pilgrimage. And uh, Islam arose at a time of conflict between the uh, Sasanian Iranian Empire and the Eastern Roman Christian Empire. Muhammad, uh, the Prophet Muhammad was the first Muslim to have uh, mystical experiences. And uh, these experiences uh, are described in the traditional uh, sayings and sources. Uh, he is said to have gone off uh, for spiritual retreats. Uh, one month a year, and uh, in the course of one of these uh, retreats, he encountered what seemed to him to be an angel, a kind of a spectral vision, uh, which uh, then uh, instructed him. Uh, this event of revelation uh, may be referred to in the 97th uh, chapter of the Quran. Uh, which talks about the night of power. God, in the voice of God, says in the Quran, Behold, we revealed it in the night of power. Uh, it's the time, it says, when angels and the Spirit descend uh, and, uh, and they bring the sublime peace. Uh, peace it is, it says, until the breaking of the dawn. So this again uh, is, uh, it seems to me, falls generally under the rubric of, of mysticism. Uh, and uh, then the Quran also mentions uh, an incident in which the Prophet Muhammad appears to have had a uh, vision of ascending to heaven uh, and, uh, and witnessing the throne of God, witnessing the angels of God in heaven. Uh, one of those is said to have come close and descended to a distance of two bow shots, uh, how, how, how far you could shoot an arrow doubled, uh, and inspired uh, Muhammad with, with, uh, with the revelation. Um, traditional Sufi and other uh, Muslim lore uh, locates this ascent to heaven uh, in an episode in the Prophet's life when uh, he is said spiritually to have journeyed to Jerusalem and then to have ascended to heaven from Temple Mount. Uh, and uh, it, it, the Quran talks about um, the lote tree of the outer boundary, a, a kind of marker, a heavenly tree that marks the uh, boundary between uh, the divine world and the human world. Uh, and um, 
uh, as I said, this is uh, all uh, these verses of the Quran are all interpreted by later uh, Muslim uh, uh, tradition by, as, as speaking to Muhammad's spiritual night journey to Jerusalem. This is an extremely important uh, set of images uh, for the later Sufis who were very interested in alternative states of consciousness, uh, in, in spiritual ascents of various sorts of the Prophet's own ascent becomes a model for them. Um, the Quran speaks of uh, the resurrection day, uh, of God meeting out justice, of, of heavenly vistas uh, in which uh, people will, will wear silk, silk brocade and be rewarded uh, with really having all their uh, desires uh, met. Um, then another verse in the Quran that's very important for uh, the Sufi tradition is the light verse. Uh, it's, it says that God is the light of the heavens and the earth. And it makes a kind of um, a metaphor uh, where uh, it speaks of a lamp uh, in a niche, a wall, uh, which is uh, fueled by oil. And uh, the oil almost just bursts into flame, even though it hasn't been lit. It says, light upon light, God guides to his light whom he will, and God creates parables for mortals. So this uh, light imagery also became very important in Sufi mysticism. Uh, another important uh, verse uh, in the Quran that the Sufis referred to is called the throne verse about God's throne uh, in heaven. Uh, Sufi ethics uh, is, is also an important field of study, and uh, there um, Sufis often um, uh, refer to verses in the Quran uh, having to do with uh, what Christians might call turning the other cheek. Uh, so talk, talking about patiently enduring others' evil, returning uh, good for evil, uh, wishing peace upon those who taunt and insult one, uh, walking humbly on the earth. Uh, and um, those are all important uh, Quranic uh, values that have an influence then on the Sufi tradition. Sufism, not always, uh, but sometimes could be quite ecumenical and uh, would acknowledge the truth uh, of other religions. Um, Jalal al-Din Rumi spoke of uh, as each, each, each religion being like a lamp uh, with a light in it. Uh, and while the, the outer form of the lamp might be different, uh, the in internal light is exactly the same, according to Rumi. And uh, so this idea that Judaism, Christianity, even uh, Zoroastrianism, and in some cases Hinduism, are seen by uh, some Sufis as all um, various forms of the same ultimate uh, reality. Um, it is an important uh, strand of Sufism. It's not universal, uh, but um, it, it also, that way of thinking does have some roots in the Quran uh, in the sense that uh, it has been argued by uh, Fred Donner at the University of Chicago that uh, when Muhammad began his movement, it, it was also an ecumenical moment uh, where he attempted to socially bind together the members of the Abrahamic uh, religions, Judaism, Christianity, and now the new religion of Islam. And there is a verse in the Quran which uh, seems to promise paradise to all uh, of those uh, members of, of, of these religions. It says, surely the believers and the Jews and the Christians and Sabians, whoever believes in God in the last day, and works righteousness, their reward awaits them with their Lord, and no fear shall be on them, neither shall they sorrow. 
so this seems to be a promise of paradise to the righteous of any religion. And uh, that certainly is uh, a, um, a point of view much taken up uh, by some later Sufis. Um, there's also uh, a, an idea in the Quran of a pre-eternal covenant. Um, the, uh, the scenario is presented in the Quran that God gathered human beings together in pre-eternity before they had ever been born uh, and took a pledge from them. Uh, he asked them, am I not your Lord? Alas to be Rabbika. And they said, yes, we so testify. And, and there's passages in the Quran where they're made to agree that whenever God sends a new, uh, a new messenger, a new prophet, uh, that they would accept that person. Uh, and so this image of uh, pre-eternity and the, the eternal covenant that human beings take before they're even born it becomes another site of uh, Sufi uh, mysticism and speculation. Uh, in the later Sufi tradition, uh, there's a, a notion of the evolution of the ethical soul uh, from, from bad to good, ideally. Uh, so the, the lowest soul, the, uh, the least evolved, is uh, the soul that commands evil. The word for soul in the Quran and in the Sufi tradition is uh, a nafs, which really has to do with, with breath. Uh, the blaming soul uh, is, is the next stage where a person develops a guilty conscience uh, about doing wrong. Uh, the, uh, the soul that commands to evil, obviously, is, is a psychopathic soul that has no conscience. Uh, but it can develop one. Uh, and then uh, the soul at peace, uh, beyond the, the soul that, that feels guilt, um, is, is the higher level. And uh, that, um, there, that soul has a chance at salvation. And so the Sufi goal is to, uh, is to ascend to the rank of the soul at peace. Actually, the Sufis, some Sufis develop large numbers of stages uh, on the way. Um, but this idea of the soul at peace, uh, the higher level of evolution, uh, also is rooted, rooted in the Quran. Um, there's a verse that says, soul at peace, return to your Lord, both pleased and pleasing, enter among my servants and enter in paradise. Um, Sufis idolized the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he, for them, was their uh, exemplar, uh, ethically and spiritually, uh, and uh, they sought to emulate uh, the outlines of his life. So there was kind of an imitation of Muhammad involved in uh, the Sufi path. Uh, and they often made analogies from their own lives and tribulations to events in the life of the Prophet. Uh, one strand of uh, Sufi uh, metaphysics uh, developed the notion of Muhammad as, uh, as the perfect human being, uh, al-insan al-kamil. Uh, and uh, it was very common in later Muslim thought to see Muhammad as, as sinless. Uh, but what the Sufis meant by uh, the perfect human was, was really the perfect uh, exemplar. Uh, so the basic events in the Prophet's life uh, that the Sufis uh, referred to had to do with uh, his call uh, to preach in 610, uh, to preach monotheism in a devotedly pagan society, which was uh, chancy and dangerous. Uh, the beginnings of his ministry where he preached to a small group of uh, friends and associates and family members, the first three years of his life, of his ministry, I mean to say. Uh, and um, then his public preaching uh, in, in Mecca uh, 
which led to his denunciation or persecution of himself and his uh, followers. Uh, then there was the forced immigration to uh, Medina in 622 because the pressure was put on the community uh, so robustly uh, by the truculent uh, Meccan pagans. Uh, so they had to go to the nearby city of Medina uh, where uh, they created a new uh, Muslim community, but Mecca came after them and uh, they, they engaged in uh, three major military encounters with the Meccans and the traditional sources say many more such encounters took place. Uh, then there was a peace treaty uh, of Hudaybiyah in 628. Uh, and then Muhammad sought to make peace with his Meccan foes. And finally, the triumphant uh, entry uh, of Muhammad and the believers uh, into Mecca, in which they had been exiled in January of 630. All of these events in the Prophet's life are much referred to in the uh, Sufi writings and more. Uh, well, so this is the first part of the lecture, and I will uh, wrap it up here, uh, and uh, we'll continue to the second.